Hello. Um, my name is Kieran O'Leary. I'm the Digital Preservation Manager with the National Library of Ireland. So I'm relatively new to the organisation, just a couple of months now, but I have several years of experience in the digital preservation realm in a variety of roles. In the spirit of World Digital Preservation Day, I thought it best not to focus so much on the work of the NLI, but instead using this opportunity to highlight resources that can aid in getting started or just improving our digital preservation capabilities. These resources will hopefully show that gallery, library, archive, museum workers, who I'll be referring to as GLAM from here on out, these workers may have more skills and resources that they can bring to digital preservation than they may realize. And these tools may also give a sense of what may be missing and how to improve. So this is my rough summary for today, which is kind of just looking at what I perceive as some trends that I see with beginners in the digital preservation world. Also going to look at a little bit at OAIS, um, what conformance to that looks like, the OAIS information model, the NDSA levels of preservation, premise, and then also things like training, um, filling the skills and tools gaps. My talk is really geared towards new professionals or glam workers who have many years of experience, but who want to get involved in a deeper way with digital preservation. I kind of initially wanted to focus more on born digital collecting, but a lot of what I'm saying relates to digitized material just as much. Dealing with digitized material has probably been a factor in a lot of our work, but there's most likely been less of an, an initiative around the actual digital preservation of these files. You often hear stories of, you know, grant proposals are created for a large digitization project, but the costs and resources required for the long-term preservation and access to these digitized objects may not have been factored in. So a lot of this talk would be based upon my own experience, but also from conversations with fellow workers in a variety of institutions. I feel like from conversations with colleagues at conferences or off-the-record talks, there are many trends that keep popping up. It's all fairly anecdotal, unfortunately. I haven't conducted a survey or anything like that, though perhaps I should or somebody should. But I think that these trends may resonate with people. So there's a general sense, I find, that people are a bit intimidated by digital preservation. It seems like it's too difficult, that there's too many skills to acquire, and it's just overwhelming. It can sometimes as well be tough to hear about the advanced DigiPres work at conferences and things like that, especially when you're not even sure how to get started. Also, it seems like a lot of people are at least aware of the open archival information system in some way, but I get the increasing sense that it's not really being read um, or not read in any great detail or that people are focusing on areas which are maybe not quite as practical and productive. I'm thinking of things like the functional model versus what I think is much more interesting and practical, which is the information model, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And also, I think there's a lot of there's like a lack of confidence about getting started how to have that sense of what is good enough digital preservation? Um, like, are my decisions valid? Should I be proud of my work? Um, this kind of stuff. Now, I think there's another trend as well that I feel incorporates all of the above, is that glam workers don't seem to realize that they may already possess some skills and resources that allow you to do some bare bones, minimal digital preservation. Now, uh, to be clear, I'm not trying to downplay the significant resource um, demands, like um, all the different like funding, skill, planning uh, demands that may come with, uh, that will come with digital preservation. I'm mostly talking about just getting started with enough confidence to start testing out pilot workflows, what description archival packages and access might look like with the resources currently available to you. Uh, there's obviously a balance to be struck here um, because, you know, advocacy and upskilling is a huge part of working in uh, digital preservation. There are all sorts of hidden costs involved and huge amounts of time involved in doing the work and upskilling and looking for extra support, promoting the work you're doing as well. 
but I really just want to focus on, you know, what resources can give a tangible sense of what's required for your institution, what you're actually missing, and how you can focus your advocacy in order to get extra support, be that funding or just, just time or extra people or something like that. So um, hopefully it's not too kind of um, silly or uh, irresponsible of me to say that we may all have resources and skills that we don't maybe realize are practical in or can be reused in a digital preservation context. So I'd like to elaborate on that now. Um, so I really love standards. Um, they've guided so much of all of our works uh, when working with physical collections. And of course, they're often problematic and they don't always quite fit into our workflows. They can maybe uh, constantly be in need of updating, um, but they definitely help with developing structures for you know, validating the quality of our work and, and giving us a sense of what work we should actually be doing. I love this tweet from Claire Fox from NYU, which was in reply to another tweet uh, about how things like OAIS and other acronyms are not maybe super useful in our field. Claire's tweet here is kind of in support of things like OAIS, which says, however, for outsiders, marginalized folks, emerging professionals, people in the profession who don't have an MA, MLIS, etc., standards and acronyms are the only thing we have to rely on to signal our legitimacy to a field that isn't always supportive. Um, so what I really love about this is that it really does give a sense of how standards can help us to proceed with confidence, that when in doubt, we can look to the standards in use in our field and see what we have and what we are missing. Um, gives us a sense that, you know, we are doing good work, perhaps. This is why things like um, OAIS, Premise, the NDSA Levels of Preservation, um, even, you know, something like the Core Trust Seal, um, they're all wonderful things that genuinely are intended to provide guidance and to focus the work that we can do. They may seem quite intimidating, so indulge me for a moment as I unravel how some of these standards might help. Now, OAIS itself, um, so it's a very large document, and seeing as it doesn't always seem to be read, then perhaps in order to get started, the Digital Preservation Coalition uh, report on OAIS by Brian Lavoy, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that name correctly, that might be a better entry point for people. I've definitely found it very useful. It's about 35 or 36 pages. Um, in OAIS in general, there's great information about creating archival packages, th uh, thinking about a designated community. Um, all of these things are constantly being criti criticized and scrutinized by those of us who engage with OAIS, but there's really helpful stuff in here too I can, that can guide us. So the functional model seen here, I initially wasn't even going to include this because it's included in every um, digital preservation or OAIS related talk, but I thought I would show it because um, it's probably the most common thing you'll find relating to OAIS, I think. I generally find it less helpful to focus on this particular model. Now, there really is some great stuff in here too um, in terms of focusing, but in, yeah, in terms of focusing your research early on, I believe that the information model has more practical applications and tells you a lot more about where you're at and what you're missing. So this is actually the DPC's representation of the information model. You see it a lot less in presentations, but in my opinion, it's far more explicit about what kind of work you should be doing, um, or you could think about doing. It lists several components that are required for your archival information package. Now, just looking at this, uh, the terminology may not instantly be very helpful. But when you unpack all of this, you actually read the, the documentation, you may be a bit heartened to see that you may already have something in place for certain aspects of the archival package. For example, so if we look at this, it's kind of split up into content information and preservation description information tied together with packaging information and descriptive metadata. So when I first joined the National Library of Ireland a few months ago, uh, this was one of the first tasks that I engaged in, which was how is the NLI currently implementing um, each of these things within the information model? Um, and are there any areas that um, can be improved or we can add to? 
So if you take something like um, in preservation description information over here on the right, if you look at, like, let's say, access rights, well, for your physical collections, you will probably at least have thought about and you'll probably have some system for documenting the rights regarding access and reuse, maybe in your collections management system or your database. Things like donor agreements may have to be tweaked, but there's a good chance that you can reuse some or all of your methods for actually documenting and searching for access rights information. Um, reference information is another part here of PDI, the preservation description information. But when you dig into reference information, it's really just talking about identifiers and the different kinds of identifiers that we might have with digital objects, whether it's an ISBN number, an accession number, um, as a institution specific um, identifier. We can get caught up with coming up with perfect systems, but most likely you may be able to think about the accession numbers um, or um, whatever identifiers you may already have for your physical collections. You may be able to reuse this in some way, shape or form. Perhaps not all the characters used in your accession numbers may be applicable for file naming or unique identifiers, but perhaps it's a start. In terms of provenance and context information, ideas around provenance at a very basic level for physical collections can be reused for digital objects. This information tells the, uh, this is provenance information now, tells the origin or source of the content information, any changes that may have taken place since it was originated, and who has custody of it since it was originated. In terms of alterations to the content, perhaps a standard like premise could aid in the documentation of such events, but this is probably a step too far if you're just starting out. And you may be able to store some of this information um, and maybe do a crosswalk to your physical collections. In terms of context information, this relates to why a digital object was created, if that's applicable, and how it relates to other objects. So regarding how it relates to other objects, there are some interpretations here that could leverage your existing work and systems. For example, Creating links between objects could utilize levels of description. If you're thinking of archival description, like this item belongs to this series within this collection. Or if you're being very loose with your interpretation, even things like genre and form and subject headings. Now for descriptive information, you may think that you may have to you know, use a digital specific standard, such as Dublin Core, MODS or EAD to describe, but this isn't mandated within OIS. There really is nothing stopping you, assuming that it's actually helpful and appropriate, from utilizing your existing descriptive information standards for physical materials. Um, at least test it out to see if it works. It can be a fun exercise to see how well your descriptions can map to things like Dublin Core, should you ever want to actually perform the crosswalk. Um, just a note on, on this, the UC guidelines for Born Digital Archival Description can be a very useful tool here for thinking about describing um, born digital records. And one of the things I really love about it is their metadata fields crosswalk, which um, kind of does a nice um, matching of terms between the UC guidelines to things like MARC, ICG, um, EAD, and, and more. So um, going back to the information model, this generally leaves us with things like fixity information and representation information that are just missing. These things are probably not going to, we're not going to find an easy crosswalk to your existing systems. I'll, I will dig into those potentially missing areas in a minute, but hopefully this at least shows you that you might be a bit more equipped to deal with um, managing digital files and getting engaged with digital preservation than you may realize. So a note on OAS conformance, um, it really just involves having an implementation of the information model I mentioned, as well as meeting the mandatory requirements. The functional model um, is not actually required for conformance, but it could aid in setting up your digital archive. Here's the mandatory responsibilities. I won't really go into them now, but it's worth checking them out because again, they may be a little bit more in reach than you may realize. Okay, so this leads us to another really helpful framework, the NDSA Levels of Preservation, NDSA standing for the National Digital Stewardship Alliance. Um, this is the recent version two. Um, it's a really useful method of seeing where you're at in a variety of ways. Some of the functional areas here are uh, storage, integrity, control, metadata, and content. Just getting to level one on each section 
could be an achievable goal. You don't necessarily have to try and um, get to level two, three, and four in order to say you're doing good enough digital preservation. When you search for this tool, you usually arrive at this matrix, but it can be useful to read the implementation guide of this as well, as it clarifies a lot of the language used. You may find that you are already at level one for some aspects, for some functions, but you know you may need to do some upskilling and learn how to use tools to, to get to level one. At least this hopefully focuses some of your learning. So that leads us to figuring out how do we actually fill some of these gaps that we identified earlier in our archival information package. Representation information is was one of the ones we identified as rep uh, representation information and fixity were the two. Okay, so there are many ways to go with this. And the most important thing is that you use tools that you can easily use or even teach to others. I'm generally an advocate for free open source software, preferably on the command line. And these are generally my go-to preferences when choosing a digital preservation tool. However, this won't work for everybody. If you use a tool like Exact File on Windows, it has a drag and drop interface for generating checksums. If you want to perform a fixity check at a later date to make sure that your files are still as they were at the point of acquisition, then it's just a double click with a mouse and you will get a report about the fixity check. So at a later point, you may want to use something like Bagot um, to generate your checksum manifest and use that also for validating your bags. However, OAIS doesn't stipulate which tool to use or what your implementation of the information model is. So using something like this, if it actually works for you, is just fine. When it comes to the representation information I mentioned, specifically representation information structural, um, I have a preference for Siegfried, which uses the pronoun registry. However, Droid is probably even more used in the digital preservation community. It's created by the National Archives and it has a graphical user interface. OAIS and NDSA are very flexible in terms of what tools are used and how the information is stored. You can keep all of this like archival information package information in a single folder structure, or it can be fragmented, where parts of the package exist in maybe a database, collections management software, um, or some combination of the two, or some of it's like in your folder structure and some of this is in a database. So in terms of file format identification, um, you know, you can use something like Droid, which um, uses the pronom registry to um, to identify your files. And it can be useful as well just for using it as a controlled vocabulary for file format. You can store the pronom ID or you could, you know, store the more human readable um, file format identification that these tools produce. In terms of implementation, like the reports can be stored inside of your folder structure, uh, you know, maybe in a metadata subfolder next to your digital objects, or it could just be, you know, added into your collections management system. And, you know, it's possible to go even deeper with all of this, maybe to use Exif tool to generate a verbose report for images, maybe Apache Tika for documents, and Exif tool actually works well here as well, maybe media info for audiovisual material, but maybe just getting... Um, a, a readout from Droid um, using that for file format identification. That might just be enough to get you started. One last tool, which I think uh, also intimidates folks, is Premise, the Preservation Metadata Implementation Strategy. Premise is a very large document, uh, but I'd encourage people to read the introduction as it gives some interesting approaches for conceptualizing digital objects. Premises, you know, when we think about things like preservation metadata, that's kind of usually the standard that people are referencing, but it also has like a limited scope for uh, technical metadata as well, but it has no scope for descriptive metadata. Focusing on the actual um, event types as well can be very interesting. I, I just brought up one, um, one page from their event type vocabulary, and it's great because it gives a list of digital preservation actions that can be used in workflows, but it also gives a sense on how you can actually document these. So you see here things like creation, accessioning, appraisal, so on and so forth. Um, the most important thing in your decision making is that it's uh, your decision making is informed by standards. When you experiment with a tool or part of a workflow, you can gain confidence that you're on the right path by looking at 
what aspects of OAIS or the NDSA levels of preservation that you're actually satisfying. The implementation itself is largely up to you. It's great, though, to um, keep in touch with peers within your digital preservation community to get a sense of, um, is there any consensus on how uh, these things are actually being implemented? So playing around and experimenting with all of this is not going to be for everyone. So um, there are some great places to gain extra help. The Digital Preservation Coalition run really great courses. I've heard wonderful things about the Novice to Know How course. Um, I've not done it myself, but it looks like it would go a long way to providing a framework for upskilling staff and using some of the tools that I mentioned. University College Dublin run the Digital Information Management courses. The professional certificate in particular is designed for people in full-time employment who want to upskill in terms of digital preservation, in terms of learning about things like OAIS and using um, using tools. And it's a really, really brilliant course, and I would highly recommend it. So it's worth investigating a lot of these things to help you get started. I guess my overarching message here is that if you are working in gallery, library, archives, museums, then digital preservation is, is for you. Um, and there hopefully will be pathways to getting started in digital preservation that I've um, that I've shown here today that are accessible. However, I'm conscious that in Ireland, we probably have more people than not who have not maybe started their digital preservation journey or they've started it and they've hit roadblocks. Maybe they're intimidated by the whole affair. And I think there's a gap in terms of building a digital preservation community within Ireland. You know, having county archivists discussing um, how to implement the information model and how to get up the ladder of NDSA levels of preservation, how to get the county archivist talking to conservators in um, art galleries and and librarians and academic archivists and with people working in the National Library of Ireland, like myself. So I don't really know exactly how this community gets built, but I know that I and the National Library of Ireland definitely want to be a part of it. A rising tide raises all boats, and I know that I will have so much to learn from all of the glam workers in Ireland who will deepen their engagement with digital collecting and digital preservation. So maybe we can actually discuss what these, um, you know, the deepening of a digital preservation community within Ireland might look like. So thank you very much. Any questions or anything like that, you can shoot them to the digital preservation at nli.ie email address or preferably put them in the chat below.